on the podium are uh, Christmas shoe boxes that have been rolling in this week. Uh, so I want to thank everyone who uh, participated, donated, uh, collected, whatever the case may be. Uh, I greatly, greatly thank you uh, for participating with this. We're going to be in Isaiah chapter 43. I think I might have had one through four in, or in the bulletin, but I'm going to uh, go to verse seven uh, this morning. <clears throat> so I'm going to read the scripture and we're going to ask the Lord's blessing upon his word today. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia and Seba for thee. Since thou wast precious in my sight, thou hast been honorable, and I have loved thee. Therefore will I give men for thee and people for thy life. Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him from my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his divine, inspired, inerrant, and infallible word this morning. Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for another day of life. Lord, I thank you for each of my brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord, that um, your Holy Spirit uh, brought to your house today. I ask that you would open up each of our ears, our minds, and our hearts to receive your word. Lord, if there's anyone here that doesn't know your son Jesus as their Savior, Father, I ask that through the power of your Holy Spirit, you would convict their hearts for them to know and realize and understand that there's only one way to go to heaven if that's where they want to go, and that's through your son Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. And Father, Lord, for those of us that follow you, Lord, we need you every hour. We need you more and more. Lord, we ask that you would be with us, Lord, in a mighty way, that you would open doors for us this coming week, Lord, to, to have opportunities to share the gospel, uh, your son's gospel with a lost and dying and hurting world. Lord, I ask that you would be with me this morning as your vessel. Uh, Lord, I ask again through your Holy Spirit that you would plant the seeds in my mind and you draw forth from my mouth only that which you would have me to speak. Nothing more and nothing less. And I ask that those words would bring you and your kingdom glory. And Lord, we lift up every prayer request and petition that will be brought forth from this place today. And Lord, we ask that you would be and oversee, Lord, the protection of our military personnel, our first responders from our church family, our community and beyond. We pray for Israel. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem as we've been instructed to. Because, Lord, you said if we do, that there will be a blessing for us uh, with those actions. Lord, we just uh, commit all this time to you, Lord, and we ask that indeed that your name would be glorified. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Today's message is rather, I think, simple. It's Israel, God's people. Israel was... They are now, and they will always be God's chosen people. <clears throat> there is a doctrine or a theology, if you will, uh, that uh, some Christians uh, believe and some churches purvey. It is called the replacement theology. It is a doctrine where the New Testament church took over the role of being uh, God's chosen people well paul wrote has god forsaken his people speaking of israel he said god forbid and so i i greatly disagree with replacement theology because i believe that it is a misguided uh, and misinterpreted theology but saying that we know that israel is a people and is a nation they were most assuredly brought into existence by god Jehovah. Yahweh. The opening words of our text declare this directly from the Lord. If you have your Bibles uh, still open, look at verse 1. He said, 
I have created thee. And I am the one that formed you. See, right out of the gate, he doesn't leave any doubt where, where the foundations of and where the beginning of his people, Israel, began. And how they began, it was from God, from Jehovah. He identified then who he was speaking to. Because in the middle of, of those uh, two parts of that sentence, he says, Jacob, I was talking to you, Jacob. Now, who was Jacob? Jacob was the original name of Israel's namesake, Jacob. And we'll talk about that a little bit more here coming up. Israel, <coughs> pardon me, came to existence through Jacob. However, it really had its beginnings in what we know and we call as the Abrahamic covenant. That's where the foundation was truly laid for God's people to come in to existence. If you have your Bibles and you'd like to turn, you don't necessarily have to, but to Genesis chapter 17 this morning. Genesis 17. Verse 1 through 7, or 1 through 9. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be Abram, but thy, shall be, uh, thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee and their generations for an everlasting covenant. Now that's important this morning. To be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee and their generations. Thus God spoke, and thus that all came to happen and to pass. This covenant was between God, Abraham, and Abraham's offspring and seed. The covenant would include Abraham becoming the patriarch of multiple nations in, upon this world. His name would change from Abram to Abraham because of that act. Now, out of those generations, God would produce kings from out of them. We just, we just read this. The Abrahamic covenant would be an everlasting covenant. This included not just a promise of Abraham becoming the father of many nations, but it also be included a land covenant for Abraham and his generations that would follow. This land was what we call today the Near Orient or the Middle East. And here, was, here is what it was to contain. From the south, from the river Nile north to Syria, and to the great river Euphrates. To the east, to modern day what we would call Yemen. And west, to the Mediterranean Sea. If you think about a map of the Middle East today, that pretty much covers the, that entire land structure, doesn't it? It does. The, a, physic, a personal physical part of the covenant the, then was a promise that Abraham and his wife Sarah, or Abram and Sarai, still at that point, were promised by God that God would give Abraham a legitimate heir for this covenant to, uh, to be handed down to. But if you remember, Sarah was 75 and Abraham, I think, was 90. Uh, when they received the promise of a son, Abraham doubted and Sarah laughed. Sarah, I laughed. What if today some of us, God, would say, 
I'm, you're going to have a baby. I know if it was Sue and I, I would probably grab for my heart and Sue would laugh her head off. Okay. <laughs> and they were a little older than us. Or at least me anyways. I don't want to drag the poor wife into the midst of this. But think about it. Even though Abraham had turned, Abram had turned to God and followed Jehovah, that just seemed so far out of reach, didn't it? But they should have known better than to doubt God's word. How about that? They should have known. But God said that I will give you a legitimate heir. Before this, though, they had grown impatient, waiting for a baby to come to their, into their life and into their family. So Sarai, knowing how desperately that Abraham needed and wanted a son of heir and a promise I think she really, really stepped into the muck and mire because she said, I can't give you an heir, but I'll give you my handmaid, Hagar. You take her and she will give you this long awaited son that you have so longed for. That act caused a 5,000 year mess that we're still in the middle of today. And if I have time, I'll get into that a little bit before the message is done. Now, I think probably for Abraham, he probably thought, yeah, that sounds like a good deal to me. All right. So Abraham had relations with Hagar. They produced a son, and his name was Ishmael. Because Sarah did not conceive, and she gave Abraham this illegitimate uh, uh, heir, they still had to wait upon God for the legitimate heir to come to pass. And finally, that happened. Sarah became pregnant, and they had a son of promise, a boy by the name of Isaac. In fact, after Sarah had laughed at Jesus, who had come as a pre incarnate, pre Bethlehemic appearance, to Abraham and Sarah, when she laughed, remember the Lord said, he said, don't laugh, don't scoff, because I'm even going to tell you what his name is. His name's going to be Isaac. And you know what Isaac meant? Laughter. Boy, God had the last laugh in the end over that one. And in that one, did he not? Now, where scripture tells us that Ishmael became a hunter. And Moses actually wrote that Ishmael was considered to be a wild man. That's what he called him in the scripture. Pardon? Wild child. Wild child. Yeah, there we go. Modern day. Ishmael ultimately became the father of the people and the tribes of the Arabs. Isaac was the called son of blessing. And he became a second generation patriarch of the Hebrews. We then find in scripture that Isaac had two sons, Esau, and someone I've already mentioned this morning, Jacob. Esau and Jacob got along like we, last week's message, like oil and water. All right. Most, we know that uh, even as they were coming out of the womb, they fought because the scripture says that Esau came out first and and Jacob came out holding the heel of Esau. We then know that Jacob conspired with his mother to steal Esau's birthright. And it just got worse and worse and worse after that. But finally, in the end, they did come back together one day. But on that day, that is the day that God told Jacob, your name will no longer be Jacob. It will be Israel. Now we know that Jake, Esau became the father of the Edomites, who, by the way, are actually blessed in Scripture. Okay? And Jacob became the third generation patriarch of the Hebrews. Remember, we had Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, patriarchs of the nation of Israel. But Jacob was way more than that because he was the direct father of the Israelites. 
I've already spoke about this, but in Genesis 32, after a night of wrestling with an angelic being, an angel, but we don't know for sure, someone of the heavenly host, that's when God changed Jacob's name to Israel. Israel means one who struggled with an angel or one who was a prince with God. Either one probably works uh, for its uh, 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 origins. Thus, Israel, being God's chosen people, began with the physical and land aspects of the covenant between God and Abraham. It fell next then to Isaac, the son of promise and of blessing, as we've been saying. It then went to Jacob, becoming Israel, and his offspring, God's chosen people, God's people, the Israelites, the Jews, and the, or the people of promise, as they are aptly called and named. So down through the generations, the covenant of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob has continued on. Remember, God had promised Abraham that kings would come from his line, in his seed. We find in scripture that as time passed, that is exactly what occurred. Because the great King David was a direct descendant of Abraham. Isaac and Jacob. Remember, God had promised Abraham that the covenant between he and him would be an everlasting covenant. Now, how could a strictly human bloodline of flesh and blood be something that was everlasting? How, how could that be? Because, well, it's very simple. Because as the scripture explains to us, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the only, the only begotten son of God. I know that's not, that's paraphrasing. It's because Jesus Christ is the eternal son of God, that through his physical lineage, through his flesh, uh, Jesus is, was and is and was called a son of David. Jesus Christ himself, through his flesh, fleshly bloodline, was a direct descendant of, guess who? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and David. It is because Jesus is Emmanuel that he was called the son of David. Remember when he entered into Jerusalem at the, at the week, Passover week? That as he entered in, the crowds threw the palm branches down, laid their robes down, and they said, Hosanna, son of David. Well, that wasn't by mistake. He was a direct son of David in that line. It's, it's because of Jesus that the Abrahamic covenant can be everlasting. Because Jesus, as, as King of King and Lord of Lord, will be everlasting. And part of the Davidic covenant was that God told David, he said, your throne will last for all generations. How could that be if it wasn't a spiritual covenant as well that was given? It couldn't. It's only because of Jesus that this covenant can come full circle and be laid out before us. Now, who were the original recipients of the land covenant part of this the Abrahamic covenant. Well, we know Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? We, if you don't get anything out of that this morning, I can, I can, maybe you can walk out and just keep saying Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, okay? And that'll, be, that'll suffice because that's the basis to this. Jacob had 12 sons, and this is what their names were. Reuben, Simon, Levi, Judah, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Issachar, Zebulon, Joseph, and Benjamin. After 400 years in Egypt, and after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, the land covenant was about to happen. And it was through the offspring of these original 12 sons of Jacob. It is they they would see this come to fruition. It was they that would participate in this land covenant. The offspring 
of those 12 sons and their blessings were ready to finally realize the physical part of the Abrahamic covenant and the land of promise. The scripture says that as they were preparing to cross the river Jordan after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, that prior to that, the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh had made a deal with Moses. Now remember, Moses never saw the promised land that he entered in. They had made a deal with Moses that when they finally went to cross into Canaan, they didn't want to cross over into Canaan. They liked the land. I guess it would be on the west side of Jordan. So Moses made a contract with them, if you will, that when that day happens, you can do that. You will have a, you will have a land grant on this side. However, your men of war and your warriors, they will go and fight on behalf of the other nine and a half tribes so that they can conquer Canaan. So not all of those offspring actually participated, did they, in entering into the promised land, but it was their choice. And, it, 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 and there was a, uh, a deal brokered uh, with them. <coughs> now... Who entered into Canaan and each, each was granted tribal land like we think of Native Americans today. As tribe, the tribes have, uh, they have tribal lands and reservations today. This is similar to what this was. We had the other half of the tribe of Manasseh. We had in Ephraim, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. Issachar, Asher, Zebulon, Naphtali, Simon, Judah, Benjamin, and Dan. Those are the ones that went into actual Canaan land. Now, did you notice that one of Jacob's original son's names was not a participant in this land grant, in this land contract? Anybody, could anybody pick it out? Joseph, that's right. It was Joseph, and here's why. As Jacob, his father, was lying on his deathbed, he called each son in individually, and he offered them a blessing over them and their future offspring. When it came Joseph's time, Joseph had been so blessed <laughs> uh, in his life in Egypt that he said, Father, I'm not, I will not accept this blessing, but rather, with your blessing, I defer it to my two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. That is why you know, don't hear of a tribe of Joseph because, the, because Manasseh and Ephraim became that tribe. But they retained their names as a tribe, Manasseh and Ephraim. I wanted to explain that so in case you, in case you were wondering. And if not, oh well, now you know too. It took six years to conquer all the lands of Canaan for every one of these tribes that entered in to obtain peace and obtain their tribal lands that had been promised to them. They didn't win the battles. The scripture tells us very clearly that God went in front of them, Jehovah, and he won those battles before them. So, but after time, the Israelites then went from tribal authority to what we call the time of the judges. Two of the most renowned of those individuals, there were 20 of them altogether, one was Samson. Samson was a poor example <laughs> uh, to others in his life, but he still must have had a, a pretty smart uh, mind about him to, be, to qualify as a judge, the judge at that time of Israel. The other and the last of the line, and probably, I believe, the, the, the greatest of them all, was Samuel the prophet. Now, why was Samuel the last of the line of the prophets of God's people, Israel? Because the people demanded that they wanted to be like everybody else around them. They wanted a king, a physical, earthly king to lead them. And if you recall the scripture, Samuel and God both were vehemently against that. They both said, you don't need a physical king. God has brought you through all of these centuries. You don't need a king. And they insisted upon it because they wanted to be like everybody else. Well, 
I'll explain as, in just a bit here of how that actually exploded <laughs> uh, against them when it was all said and done. But it's because of the monarchy beginning in Israel is why the line of the judges ceased. Now, I'm trying to give you just a real basic timeline of God's people Israel here. The Israelites demanded that monarchy and they got it. Started with Saul, went to David, went to Solomon, went to a few other, Jeroboam and a few others until a cataclysmic event called the Israelite Civil War took place. When that civil war took place, Israel was, was uh, split in two. The northern kingdom of retained the namesake of Israel. The southern and smaller kingdom became known as the kingdom of Judah. That lasted for a number of generations. But disobedience and adult, idolatry overtook both of them. First, the northern kingdom of Israel was sacked, plundered, and decimated and taken into captivity by the one, what I would call, according to history, one of the most vile and destructive nations of that time, a, a nation by the name of Assyria. The Jewish writers have said that on the march from uh, Jerusalem to the, the capital city of Assyria, the thousands of Jews were staked out. Some were flayed alive. Some, uh, it, it was just a nasty, nasty situation. So Israel went into captivity. And as the scripture says, they were spread to the four corners of the world, or the earth. About 120 years off the top of my head later, Judah then, who had tried to hold on, they had stayed, remained faithful to God, uh, and they tried, and they, but they fell into idolatry as well. They came under siege by then what had become the most powerful nation in the Near East, and it was a nation called Babylon, led by a king, a famous king in Scripture by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. Did you ever hear that name before? If not, hopefully you're learning something here this morning. They went into what was called the prophet, prophetical 70-year exile. Once that 70 years came and that captivity was over, Nehemiah, let me take a step back. The priest by the name of Ezra had received permission from the Babylonian king to go and to rebuild the temple of Jerusalem that had been Destroyed. He rebuilt that about 150 years later. Another man came on the scene. He was a cupbearer to the king. He is our phase one building projects namesake. This man by the name of Nehemiah. He came with an entourage and they rebuilt the walls of that great city in a miraculous 52 days. But as time passed... They turned away from God eventually as well. And they as well were then scattered to the four corners of the wind of the winds. Then there came along many things in between, but then came along what we know as the Christian Crusades. It's when uh, uh, England and France and some Germanic uh, people uh, of uh, most of them were what we what were known as the Knights of the Templar had uh, went into the Middle East to retake Jerusalem that had been uh, taken and sacked by Arab, by the Arab nations. This lasted for several hundred years. But a little known fact about this is, is that the Christian crusaders, they killed a whole lot of Jews <laughs> in the process. That's lost to history. I think it's selective history. But a whole lot of God's chosen people came under the sword because of the Christian crusades and the anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism? Anti-Semitism. 
that they brought forth. Time rolled then into what we know was called the Spanish Inquisition. It's when all the Jews were ordered by the church, Catholic church, in, uh, that were in Spain under King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella, that every Jew was, was told to leave the, the country or face death. Those that escaped carried on. Those that decided to stay, most of them were executed. There is a, there is a, a uh, history tells us that there was a, um, a massacre, if you will, in Strasbourg, France, which is on the French and German border, where 900 of God's chosen people, the Israelites, the Jews, were taken and burned alive. Did you ever, have you noticed, if you know history, and if you pay attention today, how God's people, Israel, and the Jews, are always bogusly blamed for multiple cultural, physical, and financial problems and catastrophes across time and across this world? The Jews have been the world's scapegoats far too many times. In fact, every time is too many. It was no more evident and widespread than in the early 20th century in a place called Germany, where Adolf Hitler in his Third Reich hated the Jews with such passion that they did everything humanly possible to annihilate God's chosen people from existence. Did you know that Hitler and his leaders of that Third Reich, that they were all deeply, deeply involved in the occult? Did you know that? Remember we talked about the occult about Halloween time? That, to me, gives me part of the answer of why there was such that, a great hatred there. Because the occult is led by Satan and demonic forces. And there's no question in my mind that Hitler and the Third Reich were demonically inspired and led. They tried to annihilate God's people, but God's word says there will always be a remnant. They have tried from the beginning of the, of the nation's birth to decimate and annihilate Israel, but it cannot be done because God says it won't be done. We live now in a world where that old battle between the two sons of Abraham is being greatly intensified. The battles and the hatred between Ishmael and Isaac is not a 70-year problem, folk. It's been in the making and it's been happening for 5,000 years. The hatred of the Arab tribes and nations toward Israel was nothing new. It was prophesied. It happened. It's happening now. And it will happen in an even greater way that will make Hitler and the Third Reich look like child's play. But they will survive according to the word of God. I believe that Ishmael and his offspring, I think they've been blessed over time as well. God did not spur Ishmael. God said Ishmael will be blessed too. It's just that he's not the son of promise. He's not the son of the Abrahamic covenant. Of the, of the, uh, the physical, the spiritual, and the, the, uh, the land contract. But God's blessed them as well. But with a very few exception, those Arab nations, they are on a fast track of trying to annihilate Israel again. Pay attention, folk. 
Because when you watch the news at night, I promise you that somewhere along that news broadcast, you're going to see biblical prophecy being spoken about. They don't realize it. But if you know God's word, pay attention to the Middle East because that's where it's all going to be central and be centralized at. The land of the Middle East, the land of Israel, is God's chosen people's land. Like it or not. Biblically speaking, right from the lips of God himself, this land from north of the Nile River, south of the Nile River, north to Syria, east to the great Euphrates River, southeast to modern-day Yemen, and west to the borders of the Mediterranean Sea. I will give you all of that. That is yours, Abraham. That is your offspring through the son of promise, Isaac. When I hear and I watch the nations of the world demanding for Israel to give up land for peace, I just about... How do I want to say this? My head just about, my, if I had a toupee, I'd say my toupee would lift off my head. It just, it, it bothers me. It bothers me because Israel has no land to give. Do you know that in northern Israel, a supersonic jet can cross from the east to the west coast of Israel in 12 minutes? Now you tell me, folk. Why should Israel give up land for peace when it's very clear that this would be a one-sided pact, peace pact? Israel gives up land for peace. They know what's going to happen. There will be no peace. It will bring war. I need to hurry up here. Throughout Israel's history, God has watched over them. Oh, they've gone through horrific, horrific times. But as a nation and as a people, God has kept his promise. Do you remember in our original scripture text this morning, verse 2? He said, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you go through the rivers, I will be with you. When you walk through the fire, I will be with you. That was part of the covenant, wasn't it? I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He never has. And he never will. On May 14th, 1948, Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion, and I'm not sure if I have the titles right. It's been a while since I've looked at it. Um, but but um, the new Prime Minister coming in, whose name was Golda My Ear, and I always remember that because I think of gold in my ear. Uh, there's lame as that is. That's how I remember that. Um, <laughs> so they, for the first time in 2,500 years, hoisted that far flag, Israel's flag, over a united Israel. Once again, Israel had been reborn. They came under immediate attack from Arab, an Arab confederation. They never should have even survived a day. But guess what? God won the battle for them like he did when they entered into Canaan land. In 1956, Egyptian President Abdul Nasser said, we will drive Israel into the sea. What sea? Mediterranean. Well, guess what happened? That, that yes, Israel won again. And in that process, they gained Part, part, partial control of a very strategic area in that region called the Suez Peninsula. In 1967, Israel again was at war. It was called the Six-Day War. Outmanned, outgunned. Guess who won? Israel. In 1973, what was the, the last of the major wars thus far for Israel, it was called the War of Yom Kippur. Once again, 
Israel outmanned, outgunned. Guess who won? Israel. Israel has been blessed by God. Israel has been protected by God. In the last, what, 40, well, it'll be 50 years plus now, or just about, about 50 years, Israel has been in a constant state of war, folk. Do you know that? They have enemies. They're surrounded by their enemies. But yet, they continue to survive. Now, I'm going to tell you something, folk. Iran can shoot their mouth off all they want. That we're going to destroy Israel, we're going to blow them off the map. Guess what? No, you're not, because the Bible says you can't and you won't. So you want to run your mouth, go right ahead. But it, Iran, your day's coming. I'm telling you, biblically speaking, because Iran will be part of a, of a Russian and Arab federation that will attack Israel. And guess who's going to win that war? It's called the War of Ezekiel 38 and 39. Oh, it'll be Israel because God said, I will destroy these armies on the mountains of Israel before you even get there. Are the Israelites, are the Jews God's chosen people? Absolutely. Do I agree with everything Israel does? No, I don't even agree with everything our own government does. But I know this, I will support Israel because the scripture is very clear. That Christians, we have been grafted into their family. How about that? Do the Jews need to come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior in order to be able to inherit the real, the spiritual kingdom of God? Yes, they do. Just like everyone else does. When Christ came... He died, he was buried, he rose again. That changed the rules of the game, folk. Israel was still God's chosen people, but they need Jesus just like we do. And I hope this morning that you all can say amen. Because this is a very important subject. And trust me, folk, I just have just slimlined <laughs> along the edges of this entire subject. But it's what God brought me and told me to talk about this week. And guess what? We talked about it <laughs> this week. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your mercy and your grace. Lord, we, we do thank you, uh, Lord, for this, uh, this great nation of Israel. Do we always agree? No. But what we can agree on is the truth of your word, that they are your people. They were, they are, and they always will be. I ask you would protect them, Lord. I ask that you would be with our nation, Lord, because you told Abraham... I will bless them that bless thee, and I will curse them that curse thee. Lord, help us, Lord, to always be a friend of Israel. Father, Lord, I ask that you would just have opened up the heart and mind of the people to receive this word. In the name of Jesus, I pray amen and amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would you please stand? The altar is open. If you have a spiritual need today, whether you want to come to salvation or you want to just spend some time with the Lord, the altar is open for you this morning. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound It seemed a wretch like me I once was lost But now I am found Was blind But now I see and now may the love of God, the joy of His Son, Christ Jesus, our Lord, Redeemer, and risen Savior, and the peace and power of the Holy Spirit, may they all go with us now and forevermore. Amen and amen. Thank you for being here today, everybody. God bless you and keep you. And always remember, if I don't meet you again in this world, I'll meet you in the air. Thank you.
Thank you, sir.